Okay, this meeting will be held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and access in accordance with House Bill number 58 of the 193rd General Court, which extended the governor's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law MGL 30A20 until March 31st, 2025. All right, and I'm just going to do attendance and then I will hand it over to Peggy. So we see Kathy Matraba here. Yeah, if you want to. Yep, I don't know if I'm you here. actually have to see it. Okay, Anna Lee, you're here. Present. Okay, Andrea. Here. Here, Denise is here. Okay, we're just missing a couple. All right, they'll chime in. And then Pete, thank you. And um, Pete Law is um, chair of our Conservation Commission. I don't know if you met Peggy Sloan before. And then Rachel's here. Not quite sure, but I think maybe. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll we'll go with the maybe. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm I am going to turn it over to Peggy, and Peggy can decide how she wants to run the meeting. But please, everybody, be respectful. Raise your hand. Don't just start talking because it's annoying. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks. Okay, Peggy. Peggy frozen. Uh oh. Oop. She's gone. <clears throat> hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I'm having some fun. real internet instability, just so everybody knows. Yeah. I don't know. I've not had that in three years. So that's right. Gosh, I know. And I I mean, I don't know whether Peggy's from work or She's often from home. From home, I don't know where she lives. In the uh, middle, Hill of Country. Nowhere. Like yeah. no. Oh in really? The hills. In the hills. Oh, God. oh, that's not good. We. She was great. She really was super helpful with um, the ADU. Mm. Hmm. ADU stuff. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, this this could be a problem. She doesn't come back since she's sort of running the meeting. And I already gave away my tickets to hear David Sibley. I know. Well, Al, Al took Judy Kundal. That's that's his date tonight. <laughs> he, I heard him in just FYI, if you ever have a chance, I heard him in Florida. Yeah, I was at a like someplace and he was doing a talk. So mm -hmm. we signed up and uh, it was great. Yeah. And I couldn't believe like he lives he's just bought hilltop farm right yeah uh, yeah because i looked he's him been up living and... there for 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 three or four years four years huh interesting wow um do we have a phone number for peggy i don't Amy, i don't know do you? anna lee may or Amy. yeah i probably do just a second okay thanks uh If not, we'll have to uh, reschedule and I don't know. <sighs> Maybe do it in person. Good. In the meantime, did everyone have a chance to go through at least? I only have her work number. I'm sorry. You could try it. Who knows? I mean, yeah. 413-774-3167. Extension, okay. I think. Well, I don't know. Three three maybe or one three three. One three three. Or okay. three three, I'm not sure. Okay. I'll try. I'll try. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Well, she did say that she thought we would need at least two meetings. Yeah. So maybe we could even just. Oh, I think she's back. Oh, good. There she is. Sorry about that. My computer just blew up. Hopefully that doesn't happen oh, again. Gosh. <laughs> I know, we were panicking, Peggy. It was going, eh. And I was like, oh. Oh. sorry. No, All Peggy, right. no meeting. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll hand it over to you then. Okay. And so what I'd like to do is um, go th through page by page uh, the areas where I had changes. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. If there are pages where you have notes that you would like to see things changed as we're going through, please interrupt me and let me know that. Um, Anna Lee had sent me, um, for example, some public comments on the tourism oriented district, um, which I'll need to incorporate in the next draft, but there may be some other things as we're going through that you think of um, that I can make notes and change. So, some of the changes are more just housekeeping. There are some errors, for example, in the numbering that I found. Others are more substantial. Um, there's notes that I've made to you asking questions about, would you like to rethink, you know, for example, the use table. Um, but if there are other things, please interrupt me as we go through. So um, right on the, uh, first uh, page. Where I guess Can I ask? It, it could it, would it be possible to see the um the document because we didn't print them out because it was so bloody long. Um, <laughs> let's see. If I I'm not sure if I can share the document. Um, Denise, do you happen to have yours? Well, let's see. Maybe I can, let, let me see if I can pull it up. Hang on. Okay, I actually have a printed copy. I can share a screen also. Someone has a clock. No, it's it's probably me. Oh no, it's, <laughs> it's quite wonderful. <laughs> Never, yeah. Glad to keep. Can everyone see the screen now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So, um, right in the beginning, under districts, um, I just added some of the districts that were missing uh, among the overlay districts. And so there's a water protection that one had exists on your map, um, as well as the marijuana and the tourism overlay district. One Excuse thing me, I, is, is water protection watershed? Um, in your bylaws, you call it the water protection overlay district, but it is Thank comparable you. to a watershed district. Annalie, do you have a question? Um, we have MO1, 2, and 3 for marijuana. Do we have to say all three of those there, or is MO enough? I think MO is enough. Um, okay. But if you'd like, we could do those. But I, I don't think that's necessary. Um, I did notice that you also have an adult entertainment overlay district and some parcels. So probably need to add that as well. And there's also um, a wireless communication district um, that also isn't uh, showing up right now um, on the map. So probably need to add those two. As Hi, this is Pete Law from the Conservation Commission. Um, sorry Hi. to interject so quickly, but in the water protection overlay district, um, <laughs> And you said that within the bylaws and such, which is fine. But what is that based on the uh, Mass DEP GIS watershed um, outlines, the, the mapping there? Because that's totally what we uh, rely on uh, for the most part. So I'm less familiar with how the, the uh, watershed overlay district was uh, created. It looks like from your official zoning map that it's the recharge area, the zone two yeah. recharge area. But I I also noticed that there are a number of public water supplies that aren't showing any recharge area. 
And okay. I don't know if, if that's because they haven't been mapped yet, but at a minimum, if they haven't, then we should be using sort of the default, which is kind of the zone two radius, which is a certain right. area that the mass DEP assumes until there's actual pump test to, to um, figure yeah. out exactly where it's drawing from. So- Yeah, and your answer just answered my question in a different way because I was thinking of wetland protection and uh, uh, wetlands area, but this is what uh, water protection from uh, aquifer for water protection thing. So I yeah. was uh, I was off off key a little bit there. So thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, so that is one of my questions. I asked Ryan Clary, our our G GIS specialist, to look into whether or not he could find recharge areas, particularly for the areas up around Old Deerfield. There's a bunch of um, public water supplies that are probably related to the schools that just show the locations of the well, but usually there should be a protection area. So that might be an update to the zoning map in addition to the adult entertainment and the wireless communication districts. Any questions on those? Any other thoughts on your zoning map, which we need to update? <laughs> no, okay. All right, then I'm gonna move along. Um, so on the next page, I had a question about principal uses. Some communities very clearly state that you should only have one principal use per lot. Um, and there are some communities that in certain districts, they don't mind if there are multiple uses. And so they specify where, which districts that can occur. Those are typically, for example, commercial districts, if they allow that at all. Um, but right now it's not really addressed. Um, so I'm just curious if the planning board has thought about whether or not they just would like a single use on each lot or whether they would entertain um, multiple principal uses. So some examples of why you might only want one use is there was concern, particularly when the large scale um, towers, cell towers were coming in, people didn't want for example, a residential home and then a cell tower on that potentially. They wanted to make sure that the cell towers were located perhaps in a appropriate district or in an overlay district. But there are examples, for example, in the commercial district where you might want to allow um, sort of a mix, more than one use on a lot in order to maximize uh, services or economic development, things of that nature. So any thoughts on that, or that's something we can just kind of just let you all mull on it and talk about it at the next meeting? <laughs> yeah, may I, may I ask a question? This is Andrea. Mm -hmm. If you had ran a, um, a bed and breakfast and also lived there, is that one use or two uses? Is it a residence and a bed and breakfast? Mm -hmm. The bed and breakfast, because typically those are owner occupied, I think it would be considered a, a B and B use. Um, so I think that would just be considered kind of one principal use. Annalee. Does this tie into that section? And I don't remember what it was called, where um, there could be like an apartment sort of over or, or connected to a business. I think that's yeah, called up zoning. Yeah, some some towns have, for example, they allow commercial uses on the first floor, and then you might have apartments up above. Um, so that would be an example of where you would have two principal uses potentially on a lot. Well, Peggy, we already have that in in downtown. We do have you know commercial space and apartments. So right. And I know we we're hoping. I mean, we've talked about upzoning to um, 
to have more apartments, you know, above businesses. Yep. So you do have in your use table dwelling unit incidental to a commercial or industrial use. So I'm assuming that that line um, kind of captures that in the C1 and C2 district, um, but there might be other examples. So um, just something to, to think about um, whether or not this is very specific to allowing dwelling units on top of commercial industrial uses, but there might be some other combinations that you'd like to consider. So have sometimes having that flexibility, but we can come back to that. All right. Um, I'm not gonna go over kind of nits. Um, you'll see that, um, for example, let's see. I go down. There were um, some places where uh, the footnote 12 I added um, that had to deal with your um, mm -hmm. franchise business, I guess. And one thing I noticed and I had a question about is in this line here, it says restaurant not including fast food or drive-in restaurants. You have 12 on for the C1 and C2 district, but you don't have it for industrial. Was that intentional? Did you not want that potential use in your industrial district. So the form-based, this is what you're talking about? Yeah. Right here? Yep, the form-based. So, and it says that it was intentionally, or you're saying it's left out of the? Yeah, so I added it, but then I thought about it more and I was like, well, maybe they didn't want that form-based to apply in the industrial district, in which case I would delete this 12 again. You're talking about formula-based. Formula-based, yeah. right, sorry. Yep, formula-based. So it wasn't, sorry, can you walk me through? It wasn't in C2. It wasn't. So right now it, it the 12, which indicates formula-based should apply, is in, is in your C1 and C2 on your use table. But in other locations like the I and the EPD district, there is no there is no 12 foot note, which implies that maybe the formula base doesn't apply in those districts, even though that type of use could happen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it may have been just it was an oversight. Okay. That may, that may have been the kind of thing that because it was actually it was a citizen's petition. The okay. formula based. So it may have been that we just, and we were in transition at the time um, as a board, um, that we just, that we were so focused on certain properties that we didn't broaden the, the scope of the formula base. And I, it doesn't, I don't, I think it makes good sense to imagine, but I don't know if that is, um, do we have to bring that back to the town though? We have to consider that that's because the formula base. Um, well, Regs if, if, if you did want there the 12 to apply to all the zoning districts, the yep. form base, then I would just remove the 12s that are right now in the C1 and the C2 and leave the 12 that I've added. My suspicion is that's what we thought we did. How about that? Um, okay. So that would be, that would make the most sense. I agree. This is Andrea. Okay. Let me just make a note of that. Okay. And let's see. Some of these are just cross-referencing. So some questions I had on your use table. Uh, pharmacies can also be considered retail, but 
There are many pharmacies that now have drive-through, which is convenient, particularly for seniors if they have mobility issues and would like to use a drive-through. So do you want to consider adding a, a pharmacy line with drive-throughs? And if you did, what locations would that be suitable for? So you're suggesting that we have just for pharmacies? Yes, because right now, if you go look at your, hang on. You have, if you look at your retail uses, they don't talk about drive throughs your, the bank does, right? Your bank line says includes ATM or teller lines in or outside the premises. Yep. But the retail sales, which is presumably where pharmacy would be, because I don't see it unless I missed it. I didn't find it in this long list of commercial uses. So some communities have pharmacies as a separate line item if they want to allow drive throughs Okay, so Peggy, are you saying that would be just specific to pharmacies? Because I think the reason we don't have drive throughs is because I think that the town did not want McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts and, you know, drive throughs like drive, drive throughs whatever, <laughs> like that. Yeah, I think that, it, it, would, it would just be specific okay. to pharmacies. So it would be a separate line that said pharmacies with or without drive through And then you would identify where, what locations those were in. Okay. And you don't have to decide tonight. It's just something that I noticed okay. on your use table that some communities break that out for specifically that reason. They don't necessarily want drive through restaurants because of traffic generation, but they might be willing to entertain a pharmacy with a drive through okay. All right, let's see. And then the other question I had on your use table was, do you want to require site plan review for large scale retail stores? Or prior to that, you said, do we want to consider a maximum building size limit? I would yes. say we'd like to, but I have no idea what that maximum building size limit would be. So um, if you think about, um, so I can go back and get you some sizes, but like the stop and shop in Greenfield, I think is like 70 or 80,000 square feet. It's a pretty big building. But most communities do cap, have a, an upper limit. Um, and so maybe the next meeting, I can bring some examples of different size buildings that are local that you can all think about and say, yep, that's an okay size, or that's too huge. <laughs> How's that sound? And then you can decide what might be the upper cap. And then on top of that, do you also want to add site plan review for those larger uses? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I will bring examples of building sizes that you can think about. All right. So those are my questions on the use table. Um, the changes in the home occupations I, are just clarifications. Um, one thing I did add in the parking for home occupations was, um, that there was a restriction on not having the parking in the side and rear yard line limits or the setback areas. And it seemed like you probably also wouldn't want them in your front yard <laughs> setback. So I added that. 
I think that was probably just an oversight. Annalie, did you have a question? Yes. I don't know if this is this section or not, but I know, um, in fact, FERCOG has done some work on Airbnb regulations. Is this where we may or may not want to have more comprehensive Air Airbnb regulations? <laughs> or I can't remember if that's later in here. Not there. Um, home occupations typically is not the short-term residential rental section. Um, so I can go back and look at that. Let's see. Have you, doesn't look like you've addressed that. Uh. Okay. That might be a whole new section. <laughs> but at least we should add it to the use table. So I should ask you, what, are, what is uh, the planning board's thinking on that? Do you want it to be a special permit process? Do you want it based on scale? So for example, if somebody's just doing one to two bedrooms, that's fine, it's yes. But if it's a larger scale, three, four, I don't know how high you want to go, but then you start to have traffic impacts because chances are there's at least one car for each room that's being rented. So if you've got four rooms, that's adding four cars potentially in a residential neighborhood with their associated trips. This is Andrea. Um, we haven't, we hope to, I believe, talk about short-term rentals, we haven't done that yet. So I don't know that we're ready to answer questions, in my humble opinion, about parking when we can't answer questions about anything else having to do with Airbnbs. Okay. Uh, someone else, weigh in. Annalie, I do know that the town is quite concerned about enforcement issues. Board of Health monitoring, that sort of thing. Some towns, um, the boards of health have already adopted regulations that allow them to uh, monitor the short-term residential rentals, just like they often are already monitoring or uh, looking at um, licensed B&Bs and other, other types of, of uh, short-term rentals. So that might be a separate um, step that the Board of Health wants to take. And so there are a number of communities that have already adopted special regulations to govern those. I think the Board of Health doesn't want to take that. I mean, they don't want any extra monitoring. That's the problem. I see. Whether or not that's... I don't know that that's the, in the planning board's purview, right. <laughs> but you can certainly decide whether they should be allowed by right or whether you want them by special permit. And um, one of the things that a lot of planning boards are grappling with was is whether they should be owner occupied or not. Um, there's a lot, I think, concern about. Um, uh, property that used to provide rental housing being withdrawn uh, potentially and just being used for short-term residential rentals, which in Franklin County, we have um, a real need for rental housing. Um, and there's always a very, very low vacancy rate. So communities are kind of struggling with that. Um, I am working with Buckland uh, right now on their short-term residential rental, they're trying to update their bylaws. Um, so that can be something that we add to the list to look at. But at a minimum, it would be good to add a column, you know, a line in your use table that basically addresses whether they're allowed by right or special permit. And then you can decide whether or not you also want some additional um, bylaw language, just like, you know, 
many towns have separate sections for solar bylaws or wireless bylaws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some towns have new sections for the short-term residential rentals to try and address some of these issues about owner occupancy or not, and things of that nature. So Peggy, I'm sorry, maybe I missed it. Can you define what you mean by short term? So uh, typically um, short term residential rentals are for less than 30 days or less. Oh, okay. Or okay. usually it's less than 30 days. Once you're doing a month to month rental, that's considered kind of a rental property and different uh, rules sort of click in. Um, so these are, you know, your typical kind of Airbnb or VRBO where they're being rented for a week or a weekend type of thing. Okay. So it's not, it wouldn't be addressing like month to month rentals or rent rentals under a, a lease or things of that nature. Um, this would just be looking at um, kind of uh, rentals for visitors coming to the region, or it might be, you know, somebody who's sometimes people who are having trouble finding housing in Franklin County, so they may be living in an Airbnb <laughs> while, while they're looking for a house or a rental. Rachel. Um, I was, that Peggy talked to us where we, that, that was why we put the 30 day um, rental clause in the um, accessory dwelling, if we'll remember, we talked about this. Uh, Kathy and Peggy and I did. Uh, Annalie was there too. So, but that that th it's becomes a separate issue, and it's super important to do both because if you're looking at an apartment as an accessory dwelling, <laughs> then you're got it. it. You build the accessory dwelling, you start renting it out as an Airbnb. That that's what we were trying to avoid with the accessory dwelling. Hi, this is Kathy Retroba. I think also location would matter, like how congested an area is is it closer to the center of town is it by the school district is it out down river road um how many people will be there how many vehicles will there be um i think i think that we still have more to talk about it but i think it does help open up and give some direction and thought as to what we do want it to be and maybe what we don't want it to be and location I think would matter as it relates to by right or by permit. Um, and also it would allow transparency in terms of fees, taxes. Um, it would, it would just, I think it would keep everything above board as opposed to some of them being just sort of rented out on the side. Um, it would uh, it would allow us to know who's coming in and out of our community. Mm -hmm. Is has Deerfield adopted the short term residential rental tax occupancy tax? No. Well, I don't the tax. Mm -hmm. There's like a room tax. Mm -hmm. Towns have to adopt it. If you are registered your Airbnb with Airbnb, you do have that. I know this from Kathy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I wasn't part of any of that, but I do know that she has that when she was doing the Airbnb. Okay. I can check and see if if you've adopted it. <clears throat> it will show up. It will show how much revenues the okay. town is getting each year. Yeah. Sorry, this is Kathy Wittrop again. I, th I think too, though, that some places they they want renters. They don't they want to be affordable and more attractable. And so they may offer cash um, minus fees. And so that to me promotes a lack of transparency. Who, who's in our community and who is renting them out? And is there a loss of revenue to the town? Um, I, I I think this is a big conversation, but I think it's a really good one because this is where communities are going. This is this is this is where we're at in 2023, I think. Yeah, the state has pretty clear um regulations about when you should be registering mm. your term residential rental. Yep. Um 
and there's mm -hmm. cutoffs. You know, if you rent less than a certain number of days, you don't need to register. But yeah, but we can we can certainly look at that, and we can certainly add um, a line to the use table at a minimum to make it clear. And that even if we are just adding a line, you can also address not only location, which will be by your districts, but also scale. So yeah. once again, the example I gave, if you're okay with somebody renting one or two bedrooms, you know, that might be allowed by right. But once the size of the establishment got bigger, you might want to require a special permit. Right. You know, and Peggy, once again, I mean, I, I think one of the big issues is enforcement. I think we had this conversation with Jennifer Gannett when she was here as of the assistant town administrator, and she had worked in the town of Amherst. And I think they have different regulations where they can actually, they actually have some enforcement. But to my knowledge, I don't think we really do, aside from our building inspector. And I, I think that's the biggest issue. I mean, we can want what we want, but... <laughs> But at the same point, if, if, if it's in your use table that they should have gotten a special permit, mm -hmm. and it, you can go online and see what they're renting. <laughs> so if the neighbors complain, right, mm -hmm. and they haven't come in for a special <laughs> permit, if, if there's an enforcement issue, at least it's clear in your bylaws what the intent was so that the building inspector can act on that. But if it's not specifically addressed, then he has some teeth if it otherwise it, uh, you know then it's just a complaint neighbor on neighbor i mean i think that's uh right okay that's right. the concern so it sounds like we need to add at least add the line in the use table yes and i'll do that for the next draft but i'm probably going to leave it blank about you know whether we're putting in yes no or special permit or whether you're putting in <laughs> Yes, no, or special permit. Um, and we can talk about the scale too. Annalie? Also, if you were able to send us any <clears throat> bylaws, <laughs> the more simple, the better for some of the other towns. So we could consider if we do, have, do want to have a whole section. Waitley has adopted one. Um, then I can uh, see if I can track down some others. Thank you. Yep. I can ask Buckland if they're willing to share their latest draft, but they haven't adopted anything yet. They're still in the, the process. <laughs> it's so funny because it was Buckland's um, ADU thing that got kicked us into gear. <laughs> and that we have a, a good a good friend on the Buckland planning board. <laughs> so I yeah. share, share notes with him. Yeah, so, it, it's generated a lot of discussion in Buckland. It has, it has. It, Brian's been really helpful to us too. When yeah. we get to the, so the ADUs um, in the use table, this is Andrea, I'm sorry to just blurt out. There is, um, it, it is described in the use table as um, having someone lit, come to uh, help you with daily living or something. So that obviously needs to be changed. The wording needs to be changed in the usage table and to to reflect what we've just passed, uh, likewise, here in the bylaw. Yes. That was the next draft I was going to add in your ADU, but I'll make sure I change the line too. Wow, that's a good catch, Andrea. We didn't, all the, all the work we did on ADUs, we didn't catch that. <laughs> oh. hey, Pe Peggy, I, I do have a question, and I know we invited. Pete Law and Adam Sokolowski, who's not here. Um, I just want to know, are we going to be covering anything pertaining to the Conservation Commission tonight? Because I don't want poor Pete to have to hang out. <laughs> he's, I'm sure he's doing something else now, but I mean, if we're not going to, I probably just, you know, maybe for the next meeting. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. Um what sections the Conservation Commission is specifically interested in. I'm guessing maybe the conservation um, development design, but if they're subdivision design or environmental regulations, but it's hard for me to gauge 
okay. um, what he might be interested in. So, Pete, are you there? Are there certain sections? <laughs> yeah, I, I was just going to give him a pass if, if we weren't going to cover. <laughs> Denise, I, uh, I thank you because um, I didn't have dinner before I started this. So I'm kind of <laughs> hungry. Um, <laughs> um, but thank you. But if there's something that you want me to sit through tonight, that'd be great. But I can always show up for another meeting. Not a problem. If you want to turn your screen off and go eat and just listen, that's fine. Okay. Maybe I'll do that. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank, so that, thank you. Pete, if there are certain sections that you're interested in, if you could just let um, Denise know so we make sure that um, when we're going over those, that hopefully you'll be there. Yeah, I'll try to, uh, I'll chime in. I'm okay. not shy. <laughs> okay, great. great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Um, so just moving along, um, in, let's see. So this is the section that needs updating 2244 based on the new accessory dwelling unit. So I need to pull that in the next time. Yes. Also under purpose. I mean, under purpose, it says something about, uh, I'm sorry, a little higher, um, near, near the top of the ADU section. Uh, it, it says something about. Uh, That's home occupation. Oh, okay. Well. So I, th I, th I um, expect this whole section just got replaced. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we don't really have to worry about what's okay. in here. We're just okay. going to pull this whole section out and put the new section in. Right. Okay. So we're just going to skip over that. <laughs> um, under non conforming structures, um, I think the changes were just clarifications. Uh, it clearly was referring to use, and then all of a sudden in B, purpose got inserted and I just wanted to be consistent um, that it was talking about the reconstruction, extension, alteration, or change of use. Purpose is a slightly different term. So that's just clarification. Under the dimensional requirements, um, the only change at this point that I made was just to make it clear that in the watershed protection overlay district. It needs to have a minimum lot size of 80,000 square feet. If you go back to that section, it's very clear that residential uses on two acres or more, 80,000 square feet or more are allowed, but smaller lots are not. Um, and that really wasn't reflected in your dimensional schedule. So I wanted to add that. The other thing in this section that we need to talk about is the lot width. <laughs> you have a very complicated <laughs> lot width definition. And I sent some examples. So I don't know if that's something you have all had a chance to look at um, and have any thoughts on whether either of those examples might work. Annalie? Oh, well, my comment doesn't have to do with a lot with it. It really is back with the dimensional requirements, okay. knowing that. So should I? Yeah, go go right ahead. Okay. Absolutely. Just as we, well, in general, want to, or many of us want to increase our housing inventory, uh, should we, could we at this point reconsider setbacks and minimum lot sizes? You certainly could. Um, I have to say, usually when you change the dimensional schedule, there's a lot of debate over that. Um, so I don't know if you want to do it while we're trying to just clean up sections and make um, perhaps things clearer, or whether that's something that you want to take on. That's sort of a question for the planning board. <laughs> I think I'd like to clean things up first and then move on because, yeah, I don't think we want to take another huge project on at this moment. 
So Anna Lee, that might be something that like once all these changes get done and some of the sections like the conservation subdivision design and the floodplain overlay district bylaw, then you might want to come back and have a discussion about altering the dimensional requirements. I know some towns have done a very detailed analysis of looking at, for example, both Buckland and Shelburne did an analysis of where their historic development patterns were no longer allowed because the minimum lot sizes or frontage got increased. So they couldn't potentially infill um, on smaller lots that basically would match the characteristics of the existing town center. So that's something that as a sort of a separate project, um, Deerfield could undertake that sort of analysis. And then that's usually a better basis for advancing changes to the dimensional schedule if people understand that you're just trying to maintain historic patterns, but you can't do that right now. And I don't know if that's true or not, but in Buckland and Shelburne, there were a large number of lots <clears throat> um, that were non-conforming um, where you, you couldn't do that type of infill. And so they did make some changes to their dimensional schedule. That's a great approach. <clears throat> approach. That's cool. So, but I'll, I'll make a note of that. I mean, I wonder otherwise, in terms of those lot widths, Things I know isn't that tied in, Denise, to what Amy was saying was an earlier issue with an A and R that came through, and maybe this is the type of thing that, in particular, we really need our building inspector to take a look at and see what he thinks about with the uh, proposed what lot width sections that Peggy said. And this is Andrea, and to do you know some. Thinking about what we have done in the past, it's my understanding that the lot sizes became larger in the 1960s, I think, or maybe after that, um, as a way of reducing <laughs> um, growth. And that I know we had lots of concerns over the solar installations that um, people were talking a lot about. Um, the setbacks, et cetera. And so I think it's a, it's a big old Honk an issue. And so we need to, yeah, address <laughs> it at some point. That'll be uh, phase two. <laughs> <laughs> or three. Yeah, or three. Yeah. All right. Just so much you can take on. Um, so, are there any thoughts about the lot width definition? Did you have a chance to look at the two examples I sent? Mm -hmm. Or is that something that we should be talking with? Right. Um, I think I need more, hmm? more, more of an informed <laughs> historical approach. I, I, you know, if you're, if you're proposing that and that's what a lot of people use, then hey, sounds good. Yeah, I, the lot width, I, I did do some research, uh, at least of some Franklin County towns, and a lot of them only address it in terms of flag lots, making sure that the location where the house is, that that lot width is of sufficient dimensions. But um, I didn't discover any that had such complicated uh, lot width definitions. That's and really so based on the research, I brought some that I thought were fairly straightforward um, and had some nice uh, drawings to mm -hmm. give folks um, an idea of <laughs> the lot width. I had I had to read it uh, two or three times your definition to be able to understand what was being asked. So, <laughs> all right, well, we'll, uh, we'll table that. Hopefully we can get, um, some more input on the lot with. I think that um, I think that Bob has some good thoughts on this too that will help us. We've talked about it with him, so um, that will be a good person to have 
bias, but I agree. And he's looked at he's he's looked he's looked at it with people who are more vested than you know have even are trying to build, <laughs> for example. Yeah. Just recently, have you seen the new lot with definitions. Can you share those with him? We can. I, ha I we haven't. I haven't. But this would be a thing to do. I think he would, tonight, maybe he was. I'm sorry. He was actually invited to this tonight. So. I don't know. Well, so maybe we can at least get him the lot with definition okay, and ask him yeah. to weigh in. Or maybe he's thought about how to amend the existing one, but the existing one seemed very complicated. Yeah, that's what that's his take for sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it maybe just as a starting point, if you could get him the, the two examples. Um, so the next section um, is the rate of development and I think you know it expired. <laughs> and typically you don't have these unless they're um, time limited. So your time has expired. So unless there's a compelling reason to have a rate of development bylaw, I would suggest removing it. Any questions on that? Okay, parking lot design. Um, I did add in the parking lot design that parking areas should incorporate low impact development techniques. I think we discussed that. That's a more natural approach to managing stormwater where you use rain gardens and other techniques to try and infiltrate the stormwater and treat it rather than just pipe it into a detention or a retention basin. Annalie, do you have a question about? Yes, yes. Here, as well as in our site plan review section, we just get so hung up with the, you know, to the maximum extent feasible. I mean, we found that applicants, you know, give a very persuasive song and dance and about why something to the maximum extent feasible isn't feasible. So I don't know if there's any other terminology or teeth that we can put in sections such as this and then later on in site plan review. Well, we could remove to the maximum extent feasible, but then there's no flexibility. Right. So it's really up to the planning board. And if you are struggling with that, you may want to have your own consultant and I think you often do have an engineer review the stormwater plans and say, you know, get their opinion about why couldn't they have or use low impact development techniques. Yes, we've tried to, tried that on multiple um, <laughs> uh, projects. I wonder though, because um, I think like the there is an element of colleagueship between like the reviewer and the people submitting and everything. And I wonder if there's something we could put in that says like, um, you know, like including a plan for this will speed up the approval process of your application, like something to like incentivize them to do that versus the alternative. Like, is there a way to say like, this is one of the, this is of high priority to the planning board and including this will, improve the favorability of your application or something? Um, well, if it's going through site plan review or a special permit process, we could certainly highlight that as a criteria, you know, the extent to which um, they use these techniques or are able to recharge and manage stormwater. Um, let me think about that some more. But at a minimum, they should understand that their parking area should include these, which mm -hmm. wasn't in your zoning bylaws before. Yeah, maybe even it's just they should include these, period. Yeah. Well, it's now it's clearly stated parking yeah. area should incorporate these. And I also added parking should be located to the side or rear of the lot which is um, something that you see in a number of towns bylaws to try and reduce the, when you're driving down the street, you know, the 
parking lot after parking lot visual, um, being able to look at the nice buildings and have things tucked to the side or around to the back often results in a better um, design and streetscape. Annalie, did you have a question? Thank you. Yeah, back to this uh, maximum extent feasible. I, I don't know where we have low impact development regulations or statements, or if there's many different <laughs> schools of thought on what a low impact development technique is. So we did, you did oh, have, yeah. a, a, mm -hmm. go ahead. I'm sorry, this is Pete Law, and I, I'm sorry, I can't find the little thing to put my hand up um but that was going to be my exact um one of my questions Annalise. like incorporate low impact development techniques how is that defined what's the data on that what's been approved what's not approved um because we're going through parking lot stuff now in different areas um and it's just kind of undefined you know you incorporate the low impact development techniques what does that mean what's approved, uh, what's approved now and not. Um, and then you talked, uh, and I might be jumping ahead, but the planning board require paving of all parking areas. Paving is not the best thing all the time. We want some impervious materials and, and so forth in place because um, within my jurisdiction, we're constantly asking people to try to come up with some new and improved ways of doing things. Um, and even in the, you know, the uh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping back to the low impact development techniques. So this is just to manage stormwater to the um, maximum extent possible, but there could be other things that relate to stormwater that might not be directly defined as stormwater. And so I, I think that one's um, a little bit nebulous from where we're going to have to come in for, for Conservation Commission because we'd probably get a lot more detailed. Okay. Thank you. So at a minimum, add a definition of low impact development techniques and where you can go to get information about the latest and greatest, which is usually MassDEP. They have a manual that spells out some of this. So we can certainly include that in the reference. And I should mention that low impact development techniques also include things like pervious pavers. So what Pete was just mentioning was you know, rather than have just asphalt, um, you can have areas that are paved, but have um, the pervious pavers basically are designed to allow the water to infiltrate between between them. So I don't so, know. Go ahead. I'm sorry, this is Andrea. I was going to try to find the hand raiser. Um, two big projects in Deerfield where we pushed and pushed about <laughs> pavement and we were just struck down they are in the same area and it's possible that the water table is just too high there uh, we were we were told multiple times that you can't plow pervious pavement um, and so for the two places the um, vesh and the marijuana sunny days place they just told us it absolutely wasn't possible. I mean, we pushed, we pushed hard. <laughs> well, I don't even think they were saying it's not possible. They're just saying that it is impractical. Highly impractical. And so one of the things that we discussed, those of us who were on one of the site visits, maybe we should really, really push the pervious pavement in um, residential or domestic um, construction that uh, large scale, industrial uses that have, or, or commercial uses that have lots and lots of cars driving on them and need large parking lots, just are not interested in, um, in the pervious pavements. And maybe we should really push hard in smaller installations. Although the, the That would be good to know because we're pushing impervious like well, everywhere. Pervious, pervious. Pervious, I'm yeah, sorry, I, yeah. So just, it'd be good to know wanted, if there's gonna be a difference. <laughs> I just want to chime in on that, Andrea. I know we've talked about that. We talked about that with VHB, John Furman from VHB. The issue with that is that it's a whole different ball game when you're um, when you're cleaning that, and if you're getting if you're doing salt and you're getting sand, you have you have to clean it differently. So you're talking about different machinery to do that. Hmm. 
And also, so I think we were talking about possibly doing that. Um, I think it was the old Yankee Candle Car Museum. I forget what it is now, but they were adding um, in addition to the parking lot. We asked about that. They said, no, it's not good because when you have large trucks going over, it's not that is not practical either for that type of pavement. So, you know, I mean, I think it's great. It may be great in um, in different areas, but it doesn't seem like it works very well here. Mm-hmm. And that that's what I got from listening yeah. to John Furman from BHB. So, you know, we can push it, but it's gonna be another it's gonna be another issue like, you know, counting the trees on our lots. Sort of the same thing. <laughs> Right. Allie, did you have a question? Well, although it must be said that the town was going to do uh, pervious pavements at the park situation, and that was a pretty good sized parking lot. So there are situations where, where there's a will, there's a way. They were going to do that on the paths, not in the parking lot, to my knowledge. I don't think the parking lot was going to be, yeah, at any rate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there may be it some areas. It was under where- consideration with us. <laughs> so um i can do a little more research but i know um there are some types of paving that are pervious um and i think they've been used in more northern climes but you're right it may not be practical um for parking areas but there's still a lot of other low impact development techniques that can be used you can certainly have, you know, use swales and rain gardens in between the parking spaces. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to still use those low impact development techniques, even if you can't have pervious pavers. Yeah, Peggy, I thank you for that because there's a lot of differences you can do. And, and right now it just says it requires paving. It's not defined. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a lot of things you can do with different types of pavement. And even if it's a hard, hard asphalt type of, of of paving, what you can do with the with the runoff on the side and how it's collected and such. So, um, I'm glad you. And thank you for bringing that up because it's um, it was ill defined when I read it here. So, thank you. Yeah, happy to to do that. All right. Um. Let's see. I think. Those are pretty straight. I have a question still on parking. Okay. Um, should we or can we include any regulations for EV parking? Is that something we should be doing? Or is that totally different? Um, that's a good question. Let me look into that, whether you can like require a certain number of spaces for EV parking. But then the question is, who's providing the equipment? So let me think about that. And I think it's somewhere down further in the document, something about EV parking. It may not be in the parking area, but I, it may be under green design. But it may not hurt to have that in the parking because the green performance standards only kick in if there's site plan review, whereas this is presumably kicking in for certain size parking areas, right? So just like for parking areas of 15 or more spaces, you require bike racks, right? And a landscaping plan. You'll notice I said, and shall require a landscaping plan, not may. (laughs) Um, So maybe there's something we can do in there um, to talk about EV. But let me, that's a good suggestion. Let me look into that. All right. Anything else on parking? <laughs> no. Okay. All right. Um, in your signage section, I noticed in the small business district, it said you could have a sign that was 20 feet tall, but in the C2 and C3, it was only 15 feet tall, which seemed a little odd that you would have higher in the C1. So I just changed it or suggested changing it so that they're consistent. Folks okay with that? Okay. And then 
I changed each sign shall not exceed 32. Um, it said each face, which didn't really make sense because you've got two sides of the sign potentially. So <laughs> otherwise you'd be having it if it was just each face. Anyhow, it seemed that seemed clearer to me. Um, and in the sign section, I added a three, two, three, seven, only one sign per parcel. That seem reasonable? Yes. Okay. Um, so so let me ask it. So Treehouse has, is that considered a sign? It has a sign in front. It's got stone pillars, et cetera, around it. And it's got a sign on the building on the side. Would, would that be permitted still? Let's see. Let me check. I think you probably want to allow a freestanding sign and a sign attached to the building. So let me check on that. Let me read through it more carefully. I assume folks would be okay with a, one freestanding and a sign on the building. And this is Emily. Rachel, if you could take a closer maybe you already have a close look at this section. I know that was one of the first things that you'd mentioned to me that really needed some review, especially potentially that it's a little bit more permissive than what we might want. So. Well, I think that, um, yeah, for instance, to put one sign on a building, like you can look at Treehouse, but you could also look at Yankee. Yankee has a lot more than one sign. And it's a big, it's a big spot. So you'd want to say that that was a maybe by right, you know, within this, but that there was potential for per permitting for other signs. I just, you know, the the one that made everybody grumpy was the um, previously non-conforming sign for Cumberland Farms that traveled with them from the center of town to the outside of town, but. Um, yeah. I guess just in general too, Rachel. I mean, if there are other sections also in this sign section, that right? You can have it be able run up against this a couple of times. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let me look at that more carefully for the next time. I have it. Yeah. Um. And then I added agricultural and farm signs advertising local farm products or farm operations. I assume that was the intent not to advertise other businesses or products. <laughs> brew cream, brew cream. <laughs> I'm dating myself. Okay. <laughs> we all got the joke. <laughs> all right. Under temporary signs, I just added a timeline for when they needed to be re removed. Um, since it wasn't clear to me, it said they were temporary, but is one um, week enough? No, I, 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 I picked one week because under special events, one week afterwards, there they were supposed to be removed, but there weren't. There weren't similar timelines for the other like political signs or so on and so forth. Andrea? Um, it's my understanding that Snowberry Court has, uh, has rules about signs. For instance, they won't allow political signs. Is that something that a, a, gr uh, a group can decide upon? Or is that Snowberry Court? Is that a like a private? Oh, it's the uh, it's the condo complex at the foot of Sugarloaf, the seventy uh, unit senior uh, living. It's a private. It's a private. It's a private development. Okay, and, I mean, that's their con that's their association. Okay, right. their association rule now. I think they can make that rule with their okay. association. Seven days enough to have temporary signs reduced. 
or removed, sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, so under general landscaping, I added that um, the requirements of the landscaping section apply to any non-residential use. That's what existed and to parking areas of 10 or more spaces. So that you would hopefully get uh, a good landscaping plan. Peggy, with the, this is Annalie, with the um, landscaping section, in site plan review, we also have landscaping requirements. There's also a Deerfield out of date best practice, best development practices guide. We've got, it seems like we've got landscaping requirements in a number of different areas. I mean, I don't know, is that just the way it is or is there any way we can consolidate? You could consolidate um, if, your concern that um, landscaping isn't being applied in, for example, if they require a special permit, I don't know if there's a landscaping plan, your special permit section was pretty streamlined. Um, so if there's that concern that things are slipping through the cracks, then we should probably beef up the landscaping section and then make sure that the special permit and site plan review refer to it. Um, but I just don't know how, once again, how challenging that will be. Parking a hot topic. <laughs> yes, and this is Andrea. Cumberland Farms has decided to expand its parking area and it is going to be taking up landscaping. And the person who met with the, um, with the planning board uh, said that maybe they should could add some more landscaping. And I, if we don't have it um, mandated, he doesn't need to. Uh, so it might be a good idea to have something specific. If you take some landscaping out, you got to replace it. I like the idea, Peggy, of, <clears throat> excuse me, the San Lee, of um, <clears throat> having our site plan review and our special permit section refer back to a beefier landscape section. That seems like a good approach. Okay. So often you see in um, site plan review or special permit that there are things that trigger um, it coming back to the planning board or the ZBA for review. So maybe you can have any change in landscape plans. So if they are removing areas, they've got to come back and show where they're going to be adding or expanding things to address that. I'll see. Did it did the further review get triggered? It sounds like it did if they came back to the planning board. It's, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's coming back. Next, yeah, they're on our, our next agenda. Next next month, they'll come back. All right, let me look at that more. Maybe there's like a percentage of the lot size that is required to be landscaped escaped or left in natural condition. All right. So um, I did add a little bit about the planted buffer strips. Um, it wasn't clear how wide they needed to be. And, you know, sometimes you just see an arborvitae hedge, <laughs> which, um, perhaps is not the best visual uh, buffer. Um, I did add a section on um, avoiding drainage onto adjacent properties. And once again, swales and ray gardens are low impact development techniques, but I just wanted to be a little more specific. 
Um, and then the parking lots for more than 10 cars had to incorporate trees um, within the parking lot and around the edges, um, which is really important to uh, reduce heat islands um, and provide some visual relief. Any thoughts on those folks like those sections? Um, Sam Lee, um, and Denise, maybe this is something for you with either CCI or select board, just thinking of the, we have a municipal lot that's being developed or is in the process of being designed or redesigned, Peggy, and um, I have no idea how much these requests or requirements would fit in with the redesigned plans. I know there is an, a desire for trees. But anyway, so maybe Denise, you could, I don't know. Yeah, not I'm not sure. The CONSCOM might be, I'm sure they're going to be involved in that as well. I don't think there's been a you know definite plan. I mean, I haven't seen, there was an initial plan, but I don't think they've revised that plan. Well, and I guess the reality is that this, these bylaws won't be approved until at the earliest, I guess, October. And at that point, potentially the plans will already be drawn up and I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> but I guess I wouldn't want the select board to be caught unawares. Yeah. Well, maybe you can let them know you're thinking about adjusting the landscaping section to require more tree planting in parking lots of certain sizes and maybe share with them the language if you like this language. I mean, I think the plan is the plan is to landscape it so it's not just a parking lot. So landscape it so there's some benches, you know, make it a little more attractive. So, but we, yeah, we can mention that at a CCI meeting. Okay. Anything else on landscaping? I'll look and see, I'll look back at your site plan review section and see if there are additional requirements that site plan review have for landscaping that we should pull into this section. Um, and then we can refer to that in the special permit section. I figured this Pete Law, I'm sorry, I'm trying to raise my hand, I can't figure out how this technology works, but under 3334, mm -hmm. um, not to direct drainage onto uh, adjacent properties, um, through control of stormwater. Yeah. There may be times when we want to design a rain garden or other drainage methods, depending on where the property is, that will not be contained within that property, but that will have to be addressed, um, you know, going into other swales or other riverfronts or other areas. So that language, it's, it's, it seems very restrictive as not to direct any. It may need some caveats, you know, unless approval from the Conservation Commission or per plans or something, because at times it may not be possible to keep stormwater and other waters on a given property, even though they're doing um, exactly what they want with stormwater management. Yeah, we should think about that because usually. Um, the adjacent property owner doesn't want stormwater being directed onto their property and having to deal with it, um, particularly for severe storm events. So, um, it, and I totally agree, but it's it's very undefined. Of is this a storm event? Is it a few? Is it a fifty-year storm? Is it so forth? Is it a, just a direct um yeah. rain garden that's going to go and there might be some input to other properties that we've you know contacted to the abutter and they've agreed to and, and, and such but it's it's a very direct statement and it, it may um kind of curl tail us uh or handcuff us a little bit but, you know. yeah so we could add something like unless approved by the conservation commission and the owner of the adjacent property <laughs> Yeah, something to say. <laughs> and the abutters or something or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, um, it just yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we can. I can add that. 
no, I hear what you're saying. There might be a better location to recharge the, the water, but typically you don't want to be directing stormwater off of your property onto someone else's. Totally agree on that, but yes, but <laughs> I'm an old engineer. I didn't like, get into a lot of details. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's great. That's great. I'm glad that you're, uh, you're chiming in on these. Um, and so you'll see in 3340 coordination with site plan approval, it said the planning board may, and I changed that to shall require a landscaping plan just to make it very clear that it should be done. Okay. So driveway regulations. Um, the change I made was to 3420. Um, it said, except in access strips of less than 50 feet, width to rear lots, no driveway shall be located. And honestly, if you had a driveway going in that was 20 feet wide, why you would want to put that right on your neighbor's border and, and have no setback, if you will, uh, 10 you know, feet doesn't seem like a very big amount. Um, you've got to plow snow. So it didn't make sense to me to relax that restriction. They've got a 50 foot right of way going back into their lot. They should try and center their driveway at least 10 feet away from their neighbors. So maybe you could be able to plow things or if your neighbor has a hedge or some other visual buffer that you know your driveway isn't right up to it. Does that make sense to folks? Okay. Yep. And then the other change was, I don't know what section 8.9.6, I don't know where that came from, but I think it was referring to 3460. Okay. Peggy, yeah. as you by um, the beginning for flexible development, I'm sorry, this is Annalie, yeah. um, a real 101, it's kind of hard for me to understand when, where, when this whole section would be used. I kind of just, it was hard. I don't know. I just weird to me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think this is in a situation where you don't have a subdivision, but you want to allow some flexibility in how the parcels or the lots are laid out. So I think this just provides a little more flexibility. Hmm. And there's, it's not a subdivision. So what would it be? What's an example? Do you, can you- So can you... maybe you had um, a series of A and R lots that you'd like to make some adjustments to the frontage? Has this ever been used? To your knowledge? Rachel's shaking her head. No. <laughs> and she's been nothing on the Nothing that um, jumps to mind. Well, I am wondering if my neighborhood, as it, as it is, would be considered a flexible uh, development after the fact. All the houses were built individually. So it's- <laughs> Do you have different lot frontages and lot sizes? Yep, that yep. Are... everything's all different. Okay. And it's an issue because of the road now. So, um, so I just, there are seven, there are seven or eight parcels. So I, right. I don't know if it can be. Let me think about right. that, whether or not you need that section, but it just added some flexibility. I don't know. It doesn't sound like it's being used. So we check with Bob, but I'm not sure it necessarily hurts anything because they yeah. have to file with the planning board. So. Well, other, I don't towns, know. other towns do have this section. Yeah. No, this is Denise. I'd rather not take it out and then find we have got to put it back in. 
if it's, it's just there as a placeholder, that's fine. I don't have an issue. Okay, great. Um, so the next section is conservation subdivision design. Um, it is 7.30, so I don't know how long folks want to go, um, but do you want to skip over this and go back to that special section that I edited, or do you want to try and get through that section tonight and then what, what's your preference? How much is remaining after? Oh, a lot. <laughs> We're only on page 27. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot. Maybe we should skip ahead to the um to the update. Maybe we should look at that. So the update to the conservation subdivision design, or yeah, I was yeah. suggesting. Okay. Yep. So let me see if I can pull that up. <laughs> Hang on. One hundred something. I'm gonna stop sharing this because I'll need to. <clears throat> See if I can get that one up. Hang on just a sec. You can tell that Emily is a two screener. See how she does that? Mm -hmm. There are those that got that and those have their iPad sitting in their lap. <laughs> That's my idea of two screens. The two screener wannabe. I work from this desk, so right. it's easier for me. Okay. Rachel, I'll have to tell you, sometimes I have I have definitely three screens at a time and sometimes four. Yeah. <laughs> I have students like that on top of me. That's an overachiever, Pete. <laughs> Definite overachiever. Uh, overworked, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so let's see if we can get through the conservation subdivision design. So right now it's a special permit. Um, I think I had some preliminary discussions with Denise and Annalie about this, that if this is something that the town's trying to promote, it would be better to make it um, just subject to site plan review. I think uh, folks know that special permits are discretionary. You can approve them, approve them with this, um, conditions or deny them. Um, it requires a super majority vote. So it's a pretty high bar. Site plan review, basically, if it meets all your uh, zoning bylaw and site plan review requirements, you can approve it, approve it with conditions, but you really are only supposed to deny it um, only if it's not meeting uh, your zoning bylaws or site plan requirements, um, or they didn't provide, for example, the required information. So there's more limited circumstances under which you're supposed to deny it. And it's just a simple majority vote. So if you're a developer that's going to have to invest a lot of money in engineering plans for a subdivision proposal, it's less scary if it's site plan review than if it's a special permit you might get through the whole process and then find out your special permit isn't granted. So if this is a type of development that you'd like to see to help protect uh, natural resources area, increase open space uh, protection, then um, I'm suggesting you might want to change it from a special permit to a site plan review process. Any thoughts on that, folks? Thumbs up from Rachel. <laughs> Others? Julie, Emily? Great. Pete, I assume the Conservation Commission would like to promote this technique or use for subdivisions? Uh, yeah, this, this is fine. Thank you. OK. All right. So the procedures were pretty straightforward. I did <clears throat> add that each lot needed to have adequate road access. Um, that's really important for emergency vehicles. Um, in terms of uh, the number of, it used to be dwelling units, which was a little confusing, I thought. Um, 
So I changed that to the number of lots. And so under mm -hmm. the proposed changes, you can do it by two ways. One is um, basically a, a, an analysis or calculation, if you will, usually using geographic information techniques where you can basically lay out and subtract any areas that are considered non-buildable, like wetlands, floodplains, permanently protected open space, lands with steep slopes, in this case, 25%. Um, and then you have to assume that there's some part of the parcel that would be for roads and drainage. Anyhow, that's a much simpler calculation than method two, which is what um, currently exists in your bylaw, but that's basically laying out a preliminary plan and you need to do Title V um, perk tests to basically demonstrate that those lots are buildable. I think the nice thing about this is the developer can look at those two methods and decide which one they want to use. And there might be advantages to method two, particularly in parcels that perhaps have a lot of wetlands where they're incorporating wetlands areas into some of the parcels and may not want to subtract them or if they are steep slope. So it's good to have both of them in, but once again, hopefully this option will make it more attractive. Uh, for someone that's considering um, a conservation subdivision design. Your open space requirements were very, very low. Um, most towns, it's like 40, 50 percent. Some towns have it even higher. Um, so I bumped that up to 50 percent. And the minimum required protected open space cannot include buildable areas, unbuildable areas. So it, it does not allow you to count wetlands or water bodies or steep slopes or floodplains as open space areas. You'll notice I deleted not more than 25% of such open space shall be wetlands. Wetlands are not buildable, so they shouldn't be um, counted in that calculation. And that's pretty typical in most towns bylaws. Peggy, this is Denise. I've got a question. Did you update this after you sent this to us? No, uh, this okay. is a separate section. I okay. sent these separate sections. Okay. Did, did, oh, you, okay. did folks not get those? Oh, yeah, right. it's, it's yeah. on page 100 something. Yeah, yeah I, no. I, 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 it's um, section 3600 is the attachment title conservation. Okay. There were, so there was the general bylaw. So the right. way I constructed this was hopefully the stuff in the main section is more housekeeping or fine tuning or, you know, hopefully easy changes. But right. the, both the okay. conservation subdivision design and the floodplain were major changes. So I figured that would be safer from a town meeting perspective to have yeah. that as a separate warrant article. So hopefully you could get the bulk of your, your bylaw approved with the changes, and then you could entertain each of these sections. Right. No, th that, thank you. I'm sorry. I was looking in the wrong section. Yeah, no worries. Does that make sense to folks, that approach? You speak from experience, I think. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, I also gave some flexibility. Sometimes they're really challenging parcels. Um, and so um, you might consider reducing uh, the 50% to 40% and allowing some of the um, areas with environmental constraints, I call them, if a larger percentage of the parcel was protected. So in this case, you'd have 40% of buildable areas protected and another 20% of environmentally constrained or unbuildable areas. So you'd end up having more open space and you might decide that that's worth it um, um, in a particular situation. So it just gives a little more flexibility and may allow a difficult parcel to um, access the conservation subdivision approach. So that's um, why. In there. 
Okay. Peggy, just have a, a comment, and I'm not sure whether if this is the exact section, but we had a little bit of an issue with a parcel that was in court. You probably know which one I'm talking about. And the problem, one of the problems is that the words in our bylaws, let's see, it says, in the town's stormwater eligibility permit, there was a check mark in the yes column asking if the project is for commercial, industrial, or institutional use. In the site plan review application, however, the proposed use was marked as municipal. So I think then that goes back to the 40%, because according to, we weren't supposed to, it was for, it was for the park. I mean, there's, I'm not really discussing anything about that, but I think that's it. That could be um, a future issue, changing, changing the language from commercial, industrial, or institutional and putting municipal. Yeah, but that's in your, that's in your green performance section. In the green, for, okay. I'll not, in, not in this section. Okay. I'll but see. I, did, I did, I did flag that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Great. But this would just be for the conservation subdivision design. Well, that's hey, also. Hey, Peggy, I'm sorry, this is Pete Law. Just before yeah. you go on, I, I did have, I think it was on section 3652. Okay. Um, yeah. Where, and I'm sorry, I'm such a, a geek on some of these things. Um, if you go up one more page in method one. Yep. Um, So subtracting any acreage that is wetlands. Um, so wetlands determination is, I, I think you want to either cite the, the reference of the CMR, I think 41, um, or s state within the resource area or within jurisdictions of the wetlands because of wetlands, then we have 100 foot buffers and if it's a riverfront we have 200 foot buffers we have bordering wetland vegetation um and there's a, a site i'm working on now that i think will probably come in front of the planning board in the next few years for development and the wetlands are not directly on the site but it has to be delineated um mm -hmm. before it's done and there's there's probably overlap that's not there it's not directly on the Massachusetts uh, wetlands map right now um, because there there has never been any direct delineation done there. Um, so if you just said wetlands and, and such, mm -hmm. uh, I think that needs to be further explained okay. upon regulation. Um, and also within the floodplains, uh, I've had another site that we've gone back and forth on because I, I, I am assuming you're talking about the FEMA floodplain um, designations yeah. and and within Deerfield I found out that there's a good chunk that are not totally well defined if you look up in the FEMA map it just said uh, to be to be determined type of thing yeah. um, not that kind of language uh, but we got kind of caught there so I just think that what you call wetlands needs determination and some kind of reference and floodplains need a reference as who defines that um, okay. because that does open up a lot of different things with it within the conservation commission that um, we'd have to define later so if, if it's done here mm -hmm. it'd be great so yeah thanks. so just so i did add in method one that all wetlands shall be defined or i should have used delineated under the supervision supervision of the Conservation Commission and in accordance with the provisions of the Wetlands Protection Act. So yeah. should we be adding the River Rivers Protection Act there, is that? Well, no, within the, within the WPA, um, the 310 uh, CMR 10, uh, the riverfronts is, is within that jurisdiction. So I think if you have that reference to, um, to that, uh, regulation to the CMR, we'd be covered. Okay, so that but within the floodplains, that becomes part of FEMA. Yeah, but so with it yep. as floodplains, the Conservation Commission has responsibility right. for floodplains. Um, but there's also a overlap with Planning Board, which is 
totally confusing to me at times, um, but it's based on the the FEMA maps, which are are not yeah. totally up to uh, to speed within town, nor anywhere else in the country because just they change well, all the time. Actually, they're they're more up to date in other parts of Massachusetts. Franklin County is like the last county to get their okay. <laughs> map updated, and so like ours are the worst. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I discovered that not too long ago on another project. <laughs> yeah, but they are updating them and they're supposedly coming out in the next several years. But I, honestly, I've been hearing that for a while. But yes. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, I just want to point out because, yeah, you know, definitions I, matter on these things, I think. Yeah. So, but I will uh, add the reference, you know, in accordance with FEMA maps. So it's very clear how the floodplains are defined. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, okay. Um, okay, the last big change is um, how the open space um, is conveyed. So the typical options are the, the per permanently protected open space gets um, conveyed or is under the jurisdiction of the town, typically the Conservation Commission or a nonprofit organization land trust or the homeowners association. Um, but some communities, particularly with uh, a lot of farming, if there's farmland that's being protected, rather than having the homeowners association own it, and then there might be complaints about manure spreading or um, some communities via special permit consider allowing um, a farmer, which might actually be the original owner of the property, um, to retain ownership of that permanently protected open space. So this is just adding an option um, for how the, the parcel, the remaining per permanently protected is, is uh, conveyed. So I didn't know whether or not that made sense to the planning board, but you have a very rich agricultural history. So Andrea, your hand up. I do because um, I also serve on the open space committee and we were completing the open space plan and it appears to us and to Allison Gage with whom we worked at uh, from FERCOG that land that is um, protected by the town and sometimes the state does not have permanent protection. It has temporary protection. And the Open Space Committee is meeting tomorrow with someone from the Franklin Land Trust to say, how do we change the land that the town owns from temporarily protected to permanently? So, and you have language in here that talks about permanently protected. Is it really permanently protected or? It will be permanently protected. That's a requirement to do a conservation subdivision design. So okay, there but are CRs that are permanent. There's also okay. CRs that sometimes are time limited. There's also Chapter 61, which some yeah. people think is protected, but it's not. It's not. It yeah, we know that. that it's not. Yeah. But there even are, just there, yeah. there are some watershed lands that were not, did not have a, a permanent conservation restriction placed on them. And the towns, sometimes the town residents are very surprised when all of a sudden maybe there's a different proposed use. So um, in this case, any per, any per, it has to be permanently protected. So the CR has to pass muster with the planning board and it's in perpetuity. Okay, so la but land that is, for example, the town forest, is not permanently protected. It is owned by the town. How do it, does... it depends on what kind of conservation restriction was placed on it. Okay. So it and each, that I don't. Par, each parcel you have to evaluate. So meeting with the land trust and having them look at the CR or how it was set up makes yeah. perfect sense. And then if it isn't permanently protected, you would presumably want to work with the land trust to get yes. a CR ready and then have that adopted by the town. Yeah, thank you. But, but under this particular section, that's a requirement. You wanna okay. have a conservation subdivision, whatever you're protecting has to be permanently protected. 
And then you can see the decision got changed so that it's a site plan review re, review approval um, based on the requirements of that section. And obviously this section 3600. We did it. <laughs> All right. So what do folks think? Do they like these changes overall? Uh, we have to incorporate Pete's comments, but Annalise says thumbs up. Yeah. Thumbs up, Denise. Okay, great. All right. So. I am starting to fade too. <laughs> I, I know that some people need to leave at eight o'clock, so we've got 15 more minutes. I don't know if you wanted to continue or, you know, call it a day, set up another time. I think either way, I might have to step out soon to do bedtime, <laughs> just so yeah. not I, for I think, me. I think we've uh, we accomplished quite a bit, so yeah. I think maybe we could um, call it a day and set up another time if that's okay with folks. That's great. Why don't we set up that time now while everyone's on, make yeah. life a lot easier. <laughs> well, and if try. we could do separate sessions, just because I know you are often busy. And as you can see, we easily chewed up an hour and 45 mm -hmm. minutes. Sure. So um, do you have time in June? Maybe June 12th? I would not be available. Okay. Until the next until the next week. Uh, yeah, June. Yeah, well, June nineteenth is that's federal holiday. Juneteenth. About June twenty sixth. That's fine. Okay. Do folks yeah. mind starting at six? Um. Sure. Great. June twenty sixth at six p.m. Okay. All right. And so Peggy, are there, is there, um, how do you want to continue with this, with what section or just where well, we draw? I think, I think we're just going to continue. The next section is um, environmental regulations. So okay. we're just going to keep going through uh, okay. the bylaw. Um, and then what will happen is I'll come back once we get to the end. Uh, with the second draft, which will incorporate changes from our discussion, um, but um, and an additional research that I've done. But I, I would like to get through the whole the whole draft and all the sections that were changed um, first before we go back. <laughs> Sounds great. Okay, we we'll just keep right. plugging away. Hopefully Thank by the. So Second or third draft, we'll have a pretty good uh, draft ready for a public information session. Right, third, third time's a charm. Yeah. But also, it's great just to look at all this stuff again and imagine how it ha has been applied and remember, you know, what we've done because you use it and then you go away from it and you forget. I think it's still useful also to try to um, get ZBA to come to at least the next meeting and potentially whether or not select board wants to be included i well, don't know i don't know whether the select board wants to be included but yeah um i mean you know it would be good for the zba but you know once again I'll, I'll reach out to adam again yeah and see if he's able to participate and i don't know whether it makes sense i know that you know amy's monitoring this tonight but um we did ask bob um bob the builder so I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a specific section that would be good for him. Or I mean, I've got, I've got the question to ask him about the lot with the definition. Yeah. So, Bob, Bob there... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yes. Bob had Bob had planned to come. I'm not sure um, why he's not here. Yeah, I mean, something may have come up, but yeah. well, if, maybe when we, have... when we have given him some specific things to look at too, I think that will be more helpful than he's not. It's not so fully generic um yeah i agree so, yeah, who, so I do there are new people question. too amy who who is new on zba maybe 
that Adam would like to deputize somebody to, because there were several people up for reappointment or reelection or reappointment. So, um, I can't off the top of my head. Um, I don't know. Well, Adam will know. That was the other thing. So I was thinking Denise it suggested to Adam that if it's not him, just have him ask him to have somebody else come. That's what mm -hmm. I would do. Yeah, you know, Alex uh, Hirschenretter might be the right person to do that. I, I sincerely doubt Adam's going to want to come to the meeting. Okay. I mean, I'm not saying it's not that. I, I don't think that we need to. Adam's great. It's all good. I'm just saying that he can get, it doesn't have to be him. It can be mm -hmm. something from there or or the rotator or whatever, but it, it could be somebody right. from it. You know, it would be helpful to, for someone who's been on CBA for a while, not a new member. I mean, probably. Okay, I'll, I'll check into that. Great. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Peggy. And thank you, Annalie, for pushing so hard to get us to do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Jen Gannett, who's not here. She wanted it. So hopefully, do we need it was, it, hopefully it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All good. Definitely. We really appreciate all that you're doing, Peggy. Thank, right. you. thank you so I, much. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So do we need to adjourn. Yes. Ooh. Do I hear a motion? Yeah. Thank you. I move to adjourn. Second. Okay. All in favor? <laughs> Anna Lee. Yes. Yes. Everyone is. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Peggy. Thank we'll you. see you on the 26th. Maybe speak sooner. Okay. Great. Bye. Thanks. Bye.